You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Well, our Lord continues to surprise us. Last week, it was with the Beatitudes which upend our natural notions of happiness. Now, still on the hillside in Galilee, the Sermon on the Mount, he tells his disciples that they are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. They must have been taken aback. Them. This collection of John's and Mary's, of Galilean fishers and farmers and hardworking housewives, they are being given the very titles that the Jews gave to the Mosaic law or the temple or Jerusalem or Israel. And they were being given them not just in relation to their own people, but to the whole earth, the whole world. Surely they thought, you must be joking. Uh, imagine someone rushed up to us in Union Street and said, you are the light of the world. We would think they were rather crazy and they got the wrong person. Uh, we find it hard to take it seriously. We're so conscious of our ordinariness and our limitations. There's such a disproportion here. Um, perhaps the people who may throw a bridge over the great gap between ideal and reality are the saints, but me, but us? Well, we can, of course, always just put the gospel in a drawer and forget about it. Or we can try to get to grips with these wild words of our Lord. Because they're not just for the disciples of long ago, they are proclaimed here and now in the gospel. It is Christ who speaks when the scriptures are read. And of course, he's speaking to us gathered here. So what is happening? What was happening on that hillside? What is happening now? I think this is one of the moments when our Lord is creating, beginning a new community, what we call the church. And he does this by sharing with us what he is himself. He shares his identity with us, just as he does in another way in the Eucharist, because he is the salt of the earth and the light of the world, if anyone is. In the Gospel of John, he says explicitly, I am the light of the world. Well, the crib has gone now since, since Thursday, since Candlemas, but the whole Christmas liturgy, all the way from Advent, all the way, and last Thursday's feast as well, has all been saying precisely that, that in the darkness of winter, in the darkness of the world, he is the true light. And now he says, and you are too. He is saying, in, another, in other words, you are what I am. You are my body. And he's saying this not to us immediately as individuals, but to us together as a community of disciples, as his one bride, as members, we can say, of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And 
if we are salt and light, it is because we are his body, his members. We are branches of the vine which is him. And this is rather beautifully expressed in the liturgy because when one by one we were baptized, we were brought into the body of Christ, we were brought into the salt and the light he is. And so in an old tradition, when uh, a child, a baby is baptized, some salt is put on his or her lips or tongue. And we know how when an adult is baptized and a child, then a candle is passed to them. And when we renew our baptismal faith at Easter, we do so holding a candle. And this candle is lit from the Paschal candle, which has been acclaimed as the Lumen Christi, the light of Christ. In the beginning of the Old Testament, we remember God says, let there be light, and there was light, and the whole of creation began to unfold from that point. At the beginning of the New Testament, we can say, of the gospel story, there is another let there be light when Jesus is born. And here, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ's body, Christ's people begin to exist and unfold so that his salt and light may take on the corruption and tastelessness of life, confront the darkness of life and a new creation begin in the midst of the old. Something big is happening here. It is in to this great corporate ecclesial adventure, this mission that the first disciples were being summoned on the hillside and that we were drawn when we were baptized. So what does it mean? How does it show itself? Our faith, our hope, and our love, which are the faith and the hope and the love of the whole church, and which are poured into our hearts and minds at baptism, these, our faith, our hope, and our love, are the salt and light we carry for the world, for the whole earth. And what does it mean in practice? Well, I think of Pope Francis this last week. There he is, an 86-year-old man, uh, often in need of a wheelchair, visiting two pretty desperate war-torn countries, the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and so South Sudan. And he goes there to say what Isaiah was saying in the first reading, to plead for peace, to protest corruption and the abuse of natural resources, calling for prayer, saying, do not turn from your own kin, live as brothers and sisters, forgive, do away with the yoke, the clenched fist, the wicked word. Isn't that our faith bringing salt and light into the world? Or we might think of St. Teresa of Calcutta living out Isaiah in another way through the works of mercy, beginning with the sick and the homeless of Calcutta and then with others, with her sisters and associates and all the people who supported the missionaries of charity, doing the same in so many places throughout the world. What is the light we crave? Isn't it just 
human kindness reflecting God's. And so that is provided. It is there. Or think of St. John Paul II, who on the lampstand of the Petrine office proclaimed again and again over his 25 years as Pope that each and every human being from the moment of conception in the womb all the way to natural death, each one of us, whatever we are, has worth, has dignity, has value, and can't just be thrown away. What is the light we crave? Isn't it precisely a sense of worth in all we are and in all the good we try to do? And it is Christ that this great Pope said unwearyingly the whole world over to his last breath, it is Christ who gives us this light, the light that the faith, the light that Christianity brings to the world is the light of knowing that we are precious in the sight of God. And then we could say there is Saint Paul because there is a still greater light that we crave. It's the very light of God himself, the light which is God, a God who loves us and goes with us all the way into the darkness to take us beyond. The only knowledge I claim to have, St. Paul said today, was about Jesus and him crucified. And I notice in that reading, that second reading, we heard how he mentions successively God, the Father, Christ, the Son, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Because in the end, the light we crave is the light of God, one and three. And this is what our faith brings us. God, not a mysterious, ominous, sinister balloon in the air, spying on us or whatever, but a Father who is around us, a Son who is beside us, a Holy Spirit who is in us. God, who is a home, a circle of love into which we are drawn, the goodness and the truth and the beauty we long for. Faith, hope, and charity. The faith, hope, and charity of the church, of our baptism. There are the salt and the light, reflecting the salt and the light of Christ. So on that hillside, something begins. Something is given. We can call it a great adventure, hidden in two little words, salt and light, living on in the church, destined for everyone. Not a joke, but a task. Not a joke, but a joy.